All right, looks like it is live. And um, let me just get the, turn the volume off there. Uh, there is a delay if you, um, I don't recommend necessarily that you pull it up, but uh, we'll be checking here to make sure everything's hunky-dory, uh, but there is a delay and it's very confusing if you have the current and the 20 second delayed audio going. So uh, if you do wanna see it in 20 second delay, be sure to mute it. Um, but we are live, uh, everyone. Welcome to the first uh, Twimmel Live, where we'll be talking about OpenAI's recent GPT-2 language model uh, release and announcement and controversy and exploring uh, the host of issues that it raises. Uh, I am Sam Charrington, your host for the discussion. Uh, and uh, for those of you who may have stumbled across this and are not familiar with uh, This Week in Machine Learning and AI, it is a podcast that uh, I launched coming up on three years ago that's really dedicated to uh, informing and educating people about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I've been fortunate to have uh, very many wonderful guests, including several, several of our panelists today. Uh, you can find the podcast easily at twimlai.com. Uh, so before we dive into our discussion, I'd like to give our panelists an opportunity to introduce themselves. Uh, Anima, why don't you get us started? Hi, I'm Anima Anand Kumar. I'm Director of Machine Learning Research at NVIDIA, as well as a professor at uh, uh, Caltech. Uh, so thank you, Sam, for doing this. Uh, I think, uh, you know, you're always like looking at the pulse of the community. And this is a topic that has uh, garnered a lot of uh, recent interest and uh, a thought process. So thanks for doing this. And I'm happy to be part of this. I do want to make a clarification that uh, um, these are my personal comments. Uh, they may very well coincide with my employers, but I'm not assigned to be speaking on their behalf in this particular instance. Awesome, thank you. Amanda? Hi, I'm Amanda Askell. I'm a policy research scientist at OpenAI. Um, my background is actually in ethics um, and uh, since working on all areas related to like policy um, uh, here. Awesome, Miles? Um, yeah, my name is Miles Brundage, and I'm also on the policy team at OpenAI. Uh, my background is more in social science and tech policy, um, and I have a particular interest in malicious uses of AI and was involved in a report last year on the topic, so it's part of my interest here. Awesome. Rob? Hey, everyone. I'm Rob Munro. I'm a VP of product at Lilt. Uh, Lilt makes uh, technology that combines human and machine translation. Uh, my background is, is mixed. Uh, I've been a founder and executive at a number of AI startups. Uh, in larger companies, I ran product for AWS's first natural language processing and translation services. Uh, and before I, I moved here to, to the US to, to get a PhD in, in NLP at Stanford, uh, I was working in post-conflict development in Sierra Leone and Liberia uh, for the United Nations. Uh, and I've continued uh, to work in disaster response, uh, both for, for man-made and natural disasters since then. Great. And Stephen. Hi, I'm Stephen Meridy, um, most commonly known on the internet as Smerity. And uh, I'm an independent AI researcher, but the primary reason I'm interested here is that uh, I focus on language modeling as my research area. And I've held uh, state-of-the-art results on some of the same results as OpenAI's AI, model. And two of the data sets that they get state-of-the-art results on are on mine. Awesome, awesome. So let's dive right in. And uh, given your focus on this area, Stephen, you would be a great person to kind of provide some context for us. What is a language model, and you know how are they used? Why are they important? And what's the the kind of context, the technical context in which this announcement was made? Right. So language modeling uh, for anyone who hasn't run across it yet. Um, if you have your you know, phone out and you're doing your normal typing, uh, the predictive keyboard is essentially you know, the, the time you'll run into your language models the most. Uh, so the aim is just to guess the next word in your sequence. Um, but then you can, of course, go for some more complicated steps along. Rather than guessing words, you could guess characters or tokens. 
Um, but yeah, the, the underlying technology is literally just guess the next token in the sequence, whatever the sequence might be. Um, and so you have most likely run into it with your phone, but it's also used in uh, speech recognition to uh, disambiguate certain words. So the word recognition itself could be rec the ignition of a car, theoretically, or it could be you know, speech recognition. Um, so it's used there. It's also used in a number of other situations um, in similar contexts or abstract summarization and so on. Um, but most recently, the kind of really interesting step has been that these incredibly complex language models, if you run them over enough data, um, can basically capture a bunch of subtasks that you don't ask it to capture by just guessing the next word, but it might end up learning that anyway. So things like uh, counting in uh, certain models, we never tell them how a model is supposed to count, but it ends up doing that to be able to guess um, text. Um, and you can then take this model and slot it into a more complex system where it kind of this knowledge that it's already uh, gotten just to be able to guess the next word in the sequence well ends up transferring to these other tasks. So things like sentiment analysis or um, question answering or translation. Awesome. And so how are, there are some standard uh, tests it sounds like that are used to kind of assess the performance of language models. What are some of these tests? Yeah, so the um, kind of, the absolute standard is something called perplexity, which is basically how confused is a language model when you tell it what the next token is. Um, so if you're you know, guessing and you say New York and you're gonna guess the next word and you say city, um, if I said New York state, you know, maybe I'm not that confused by it because I was thinking that as well, but usually it's city. Um, versus if uh, you, know, you came up with New York um, static or something like that, some completely unexpected word, then you'll see the um, perplexity spike. So basically the only aim for language modeling is to minimize how confused the model is at having seen like a given sequence. Um, and so that's kind of the metric that OpenAI focus on and kind of all these previous papers have as well. Okay. Uh, and so Miles and Amanda, this, uh, this work with GPT-2 is, uh, as the two indicates, the second in a series of uh, research uh, into language models. Can you talk a little bit about the, the background of this project as well as um, the, the type of model specifically that it represents, uh, namely transformer models? Yeah, so I mean, we've been interested in sort of unsupervised learning of, of useful representations of text for a while and the sentiment neuron paper uh, or a blog post, I believe a year or two ago was an example of sort of early interest at, at uh, OpenAI and the first GP2 GPT paper as well. Uh, the main difference in uh, in terms of uh, you know GPT two versus previous uh, transformer based language models is scale. So uh, it's not the biggest language model that's ever been uh, produced, but is uh, as far as we know, it's the best performing model along various metrics, including the quantitative ones as well as uh, sort of qualitative assessment of the quality of long uh, text production. Um, and specifically in terms of like size. Uh, you know, the range is, you know, from millions to billions of parameters and the, the one that we have chosen not to release is 1.5 billion. So there have been bigger language models uh, previously, but what's interesting here is that there's a very diverse data set being used to produce it and make use of this larger capacity of the model. And the GPT sort of model is easier to sample from than say BERT or other uh, sort of uh, recent efforts uh, to sort of push language modeling beyond this scale. Okay. And uh, the specific type of models, a transformer model, what does that uh, represent? I think probably Smarity would be a better person <laughs> to answer that. <laughs> okay, so the transformer model, many of the audience might have heard of like recurrent neural networks or RNNs and LSTMs, that type of thing. Um, the idea with that would be, imagine you could only see one word on a page at a time and you only had one button, which was to go to the next word. So that's the way the LSTM or recurrent neural network ends up looking at text and trying to guess the next word. Um, and the problem with that is, I don't know about the rest of the panelists, but my memory is terrible. So about 10 words in, I'll have forgotten what everything was behind that. Um, the idea with the transformer network is instead of having this you know, step along one at a time, you say, OK, um, I have 100 words, and I'm trying to guess the next word. Um, the word at the very end can basically talk to all of the words previous to it and try and pull in some of uh, their knowledge based on whether or not you know, I should be essentially talking to you. So if I'm about to say, uh, if I, the last word is president, 
um, I might look back the last 100 characters, uh, 100 words, and I might find some other exact instances of president. So a good idea there would be just to grab the next word along. Um, or you might do something more complicated where multiple words kind of have to chat to each other. And so that's the idea of this attention phase where words can look around at other words um, based on how you know, interesting they are to th that given word. Um, and you go through multiple stages of this and hopefully at the end, um, all of kind of the relevant knowledge from this sequence will be um, captured in the very word at the end and that word can go, cool, I was gonna say you know, Obama or Trump or Nixon or something like that. Awesome, awesome. So, yeah. uh, so a big uh, part of the, the controversy, I suppose, with the release of this model was, you know, not so much the, the research itself and the technical details, uh, but kind of the way the model was released. Uh, Rob, I'm wondering if you can maybe provide some context from your perspective, uh, just reflecting on the release and the firestorm that it created, at least in Twitter. I don't want to over amplify it. Uh, Twitter can be a bit of an echo chamber, as we all know. Um, but what's your take on, you know, some of the things that were um, maybe controversial about the announcement? Yeah, happy to. And, and Miles and Amanda, correct me if I'm uh, characterizing OpenAI wrong. Uh, so uh, I believe that OpenAI decided not to make this model public, which is uh, something that's been standard recently in the research community. And the reason behind this was uh, because the potential negative use cases outweighed the positive ones. Uh, so you could get bad actors who could use a model like this uh, uh, to, for example, generate fake news, which stylistically um, sounded very much like a, a, a real person. Um, and so it could be used for, for things like um, election meddling um, or um, uh, generally uh, creating uh, discontent um, um, on the internet, uh, both by you know, individual trolls or, or potentially state-sponsored. Uh, so is that is that is that correct, OpenAI folk? Yeah, I mean, w one thing I'd clarify is that you know we did not claim, nor are we confident that the out that the negative uh, uses of GPT two would outweigh the risks, but rather that we're not confident that they wouldn't, and that you know w w this is sort of what seems to us like a you know sort of precautionary approach in this context of given the sort of you know irreversibility of release. Do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, this sounds then, great. So I think it's easy to think that you have to have like really high confidence that what you're releasing is going to have negative consequences before you decide uh, to at least do a partial release. Um, I think our thought was that caution early uh, is a good plan and then to try and get feedback uh, on this approach. So it might be that, uh, you know, one criticism might be that this is kind of like too preemptive or too early. Um, and I think it's just that the costs of uh, starting to think about these things early are generally lower than the costs of uh, thinking about them too late when you are fairly confident that the misuse risk is high. Um, so this was like uh, some of the kind of reasoning that went behind this. And then as Miles said, you know, deciding to do a partial release is reversible, whereas deciding to do a full release is not reversible. So exercising caution can mean initially doing a partial release. And that was uh, what we decided to do. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I guess that's a very fair distinction. Um, not yet knowing rather than being, being confident that it was necessarily bad. Yeah, and, and so this is like certainly a decision process that I've, I've had to be go through many times in the past. Um, so um, in, uh, in, in uh, disaster response in um, during the Arab Spring in particular, um, uh, thinking about what kinds of data were being collected um, and how, uh, for example, if you take a tweet of someone reporting a blocked road, um, they don't know why it's blocked, but then all of a sudden uh, you recontextualize that and uh, you're reporting that there are rebel movements in an area. And now that the rebels know that uh, you've reported them. Um, uh, so you have to be very careful about taking other people's data and, and releasing that. And, and certainly, um, you know, uh, building a model on, on open data like OpenAI did and then re-releasing that, that counts as uh, recontextualizing. Uh, similarly, I, I've seen every uh, form of propaganda, broadcast radio through to social media uh, used in, in Sierra Leone and Liberia, a country that I used to live in, uh, and I've worked in electoral monitoring in, uh, uh, during their elections there. Um, and even when there weren't state-sponsored actors made decisions like this. Uh, so when I was responding uh, to the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, um, and uh, since released uh, data which machine learning uh, scientists uh, can build on, we deliberately omitted all the data which reported uh, unaccompanied minors, uh, children who are alone. Um, uh, for this very reason, we, we believe that uh, 
the potential negative use cases were something we, we couldn't protect well for. Um, and so this wasn't something that we wanted to make available. Uh, so I, I appreciate that, that decision process. I, uh, to characterize the, the outcry, um, uh, I think that there's two aspects to it. Um, one, um, at least me at least, I, I didn't see the, the context and how this decision was made. It, it felt a little bit buried in, in the paper and it probably deserved more space in the article. Hopefully I'm preaching to the converted because we've got OpenAI's ethics people here, not their, <laughs> not their <laughs> machine learning people. Um, and I think the other, which is less for me to speak about, I don't call myself a practicing researcher now, is that um, the, um, the paper very proudly reported new state-of-the-art results um, for a model that wasn't then immediately available uh, to the research community to, uh, uh, to uh, replicate. Yeah, can I add one point on sort of uh, the norm that uh, you mentioned around openness? I think it's important to sort of, uh, you know, be clear that it was not the case that before this, everyone always released all their state-of-the-art models all the time. It's rather that it was rarely or, you know, um, it was rarely the case that people had explicitly used sort of misuse of the model of the sorts uh, and of the sorts that we're worried about as a justification as opposed to profit or uh, sort of, you know, keeping things under wrap in order to have a big announcement or something like that. So it's the motivation for non-release that I think is distinctive as opposed to that we didn't publish everything. Was, was there a big recent paper in, in language modeling where they didn't release? So I'm thinking of the, the big recent ones kind of in, in reverse chronological order being Laser uh, from Facebook, Bert from Google, and Elmo um, from Allen Institute. Um, I believe they all released their models. Where are there, are there others I'm not aware of? Yeah, so I was speaking more about AI generally. It might be the case that there's more of a tendency towards publication in the language model literature mm -hmm. specifically. Right, right. Uh, and so part of the, the issue that this raises is around uh, reproducibility. And I'm sure we'll come back to that in the conversation. Uh, Anima, you've also raised some issues around the um, kind of the way it's been handled from uh, just a reporting and media relations perspective. Can you elaborate on those? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I certainly understand that it's important to think about malicious use cases and all the impact of releasing a certain technology, right? So I'm appreciative of the thought process that goes into the risk analysis. Uh, but as Miles pointed out, uh, that's uh, never been the reason for not releasing a language model before. So that's, uh, you know, suddenly like where the new risk is coming up that didn't come up with the earlier models, which are nearly as good, if not as good. And, and also the claim that this is much better than the previous models is not even something the research community has verified or can easily verify without access to the models. So there is the issue of like uh, truly understanding what the capabilities of the most recent model are and having independent researchers uh, evaluate that effectiveness. And before all that's done, it felt like the media was at the center stage of all this, right? And the access was only given to journalists and in a very limited way um, to write articles for the public. So before it reached uh, uh, the research community, before there was any chance to evaluate its technical capabilities, uh, you know, there was these huge like kind of uh, media uh, blitz on, uh, you know, the Terminator coming, it's gotten so dangerous that AI needs to be locked up in a vault. These kind of articles, you know, promoted a lot of fear mongering uh, that's already been present in some of these general media articles. And that's where this distortion of the scientific facts and the current capabilities uh, that I have big issues with. Okay. And, and another issue that's been raised uh, along the lines of the reproducibility uh, concern has been one about um, open source and, and the model's source code being open. Uh, Stephen, is that one that you have a uh, um, thought on? Yeah, I, so the idea that um, the model being open, that's been a pretty popular idea for many of the AI research labs. Um, as Miles mentioned, it isn't the default. Um, there are many kind of papers that don't publish their models or don't publish their code. 
But um, you know, one of the, the main ideas behind kind of this entire field is the open nature of our work. You know, you publish uh, the papers on the archive, there's no payment to get the paper. Um, the techniques are generally very well known um, by everyone involved and there are free um, you know, toolkits or frameworks. Um, and to this stage, you know, uh, Google's uh, collaboratory or what have you, they can give you free GPUs. This is a great um, idea because you know, basically anyone can get involved. If someone would like to, they could take OpenAI's language model or you know, one from Google or NVIDIA and test and see how it works, um, potentially use it for other applications. So open reproducible research, um, it kind of hits all those lines down, whether or not someone can take the model and improve it, whether they can take it to use it for an interesting application, um, whether they can just explore the current capabilities um, as you know, maybe a researcher trying to understand the latest advances. Um, yeah, uh, and at some point I'll come back to kind of my also perspective on well, basically, like I, I love the kind of discussion and the OpenAI um, model itself. I'm, you know, always interested in language modeling research. Um, but I feel like one issue was that everything kind of came together. It was a new language model. It was discussions about responsible disclosure, how journalists react to AI research and publication, and then how the general media consumes it. I think that was one of the main things, kind of powering this confused firestorm on Twitter and potentially in media. Yeah, Amanda and Miles, you're shaking your heads. Uh, we agree, we agree. Um, thoughts from, from you? You're muted. That was my fault. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of points being raised. I think one thing uh, I just want to go back to a point that was made earlier, um, where there's this kind of question of like, well, it's like, you know, we've seen lots of really impressive language models before. Um, the way that this was presented was if, like as if this is some kind of like change in kind, you know, what, what's this new risk that's arising that wasn't arising before? Um, and I think on this, one thing that's worth noting is just that if uh, machine learning is an area where you see incremental progress, one concern you might have is the point at which it makes sense to uh, do something like partial disclosure of research um, is always going to kind of look like the wrong point because it's going to be this sudden shift from full disclosure of models in the case of like language models to like a partial release um, like what we did here. Um, but if it's the case that you always just have these like uh, incremental improvements and this is like an example of it, uh, there might not be some huge shift. Uh, it might not be that you saw some like completely new um, potential misuse. It's just that at some point you have to make the decision. Um, so I guess I want to say like it doesn't, we weren't uh, intending to imply that it was like something that it wasn't. I think we were very explicit in the blog post and in the paper um, about like the nature of the research and where it sat in relation to other research. But it's hard to, you know, convey that while also deciding that you're going to do a slightly different uh, release type from what's happened before. Yeah, I mean, we did try and, you know, be clear that we were talking both about, you know, GPT-2 as well as language models in general, but I think we could have been a lot clearer about sort of what are the threats of GPT-2 mm -hmm. raw versus GPT-2 fine-tuned versus, you know, GPT-3 or, you know, someone reproducing it. So, and like, what are the sort of, you know, domains or skill levels required for these different things? So this is something that we plan to be a lot more transparent about in the future about like, why would we do this and what are the trade-offs involved and... Uh, sort of, you know, what what was what were the options we considered, and why did we not do the things that people are saying, yeah, we should do now? Anima, you're reacting to this. <laughs> I think uh, I I I am kind of worried when it's uh, you know when Amanda said that uh, you know just because it's incremental doesn't mean we'll you know that at some point we should stop releasing or only do this partial release, right? And that's what. I'm worried about if the community is moving towards uh, away from openness and to closed uh, setting, uh, just because one day we suddenly feel there is a threat. And even if there is, it's not going to help, right? Because there's already so much available in the open, and it's so easy to you know go look at these ideas and including the blog post and the paper from OpenAI and reproduce this. Um, I think it was Stephen who commented on uh, Twitter about the kind of resources it takes for a bad actor to truly reproduce if they wanted to, and it's not a lot, right? So, uh, you know, so it's not really stopping the bad actors and these malicious use cases because of this, um, uh, 
you know, partial release and uh, holding back this full scale model, but what it's, uh, who it's truly hurting are the academic researchers, you know, the students, the junior researchers with the least access to the resources, you know, the marginalized communities, maybe, you know, people across the world where there is less compute infrastructure. I mean, they cannot easily uh, reproduce the results. That'll, it'll take them a lot more to go, go and reproduce and then do further research. So it's hurting the research community a lot more and almost doing nothing to stop the malicious use cases, in my view. I'd like to interject with a question from uh, a user on YouTube, G23, who asks, you know, would it be possible, and this is asking maybe a bit of a theoretical, but would it be possible to establish some kind of partnership program so that researchers, kind of vetted researchers, could get access to this uh, to this work without fully making it open? Is that something that OpenAI has considered? Um, yeah, so absolutely. Um, and you know, there's an email address on the blog, po the original blog post, where you can suggest both you know specific use cases that you're interested in, as well as ideas around you know alleviating these trade-offs in terms of access versus limiting misuse. Um, to comment briefly on uh, Anima's point around openness, I totally agree. There are tons of benefits of openness, and it's been, you know, the, the benefits of openness, if anything, have become more acute to us through this process because it's frustrating, you know, making claims that people are saying, you know, are unsubstantiated and trying to sort of, uh, you know, persuade people that, you know, we're not making this up, that there are actually these capabilities. So it's super, uh, you know, frustrating to have to deal with that trade off. And, you know, we, it, it's quite possible that we made the wrong uh, choice that, you know, we should have been thinking more. I mean, we did think to some extent, we should have been thinking more about sort of the low, you know, low compute, you know, uh, sorts of actors, uh, you know, act people in developing countries and so forth who, you know, could only get access to this through a pre-trained model. But it's, I think it's also quite plausible, plausible and I hope it's the case that we made the right call and that having a sort of breathing period to have this conversation and start thinking more critically about defenses and coordination around these topics will actually be a net benefit. Yeah, yeah one thing that's, that's can, uh, go ahead, Amanda. No, it's just to one of the points. I mean, I think we're thinking a lot about uh, these considerations. So things like, are there ways that we can um, give access to this kind of work to academics who want to work on it, for example? Also, are there ways of interacting like across industry or like, you know, people suggested a kind of partnership? Um, we're interested in exploring all of those ideas. And I think one of the purposes of sort of starting a conversation here um, was to get a lot of that out on the table and not to say something like, oh, we want to just take action on our own and decide to close things off. The goal is really to start a conversation around this and get feedback, um, not to say something like, yes, we're just like, we think that we can like prevent misuse by simply closing up research or something like that. That's like not the intention. So just to like earlier points that people made. Yeah. One of the things that it confused me a little bit about the conversation uh, that as I was following it on Twitter was there seemed to be, uh, and it came up in this conversation as well, some suggestion that the models themselves weren't particularly novel. And I guess part of the issues is that we can't really know. Um, but Jeremy Howard, for example, seemed to suggest that the models were, you know, the code is out there to do what OpenAI did. They just did it at a scale that no one has done before. Uh, I wonder if anyone has a take on that. Uh, I certainly do. If um, I can jump in, please. So yeah. uh, much of the much of the model is really quite the same as um, OpenAI's previous release of GPT. Um, and the main thing I, I kind of refer to these as scale it till it breaks um, models, um, where you just take an existing model and you you ask a you know, interesting question because this is something you can ask with machine learning. If you just keep scaling the model up and keep throwing in more data, does the behavior of the model change substantially? Um, and so that's really the the question that the um, OpenAI team were asking, not necessarily like, you know, we have a new whiz bang model underneath the surface. But because of that, that also does, um, you know, raise some interesting questions along with the fact that um, OpenAI released the code immediately. Um, because uh, in terms of kind of responsible disclosure for this, uh, anyone can kind of reproduce the research either with their existing code or with previously released code. Um, and I think Anima mentioned, I, I kind of crunched numbers. It's about $43,000 to 
So it's suddenly not cheap, but for you know a state actor or someone else like that, or a substantially large company, it's suddenly within you know their their ability to do so. But the model itself hasn't really strongly changed, and so it's more a question of I guess capabilities when you scale the models up to this size. Uh, Rob, how about you? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'd actually like to go back to the, the question of limited release as well. Uh, so uh, most research institutions have some form of IRB, all in the US do, so ethical review boards, um, who do exactly this. And so when I was doing my PhD, uh, some of the data I looked at was healthcare messages in, uh, in the Chichewa language of Malawi. Uh, and because they contain PII, I had to go through a review process um, both here in the USA and then also in Malawi to get approval to use this data and you know, uh, promise to treat it carefully, delete it when I no longer needed it. Um, so a lot of these processes are already in place. Um, people in other scientific disciplines, uh, especially uh, biological and, and medical ones, routinely have to go through this process. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I think that already exists for a lot of AI researchers. And that kind of takes me into the, the point that I wanted to make because uh, yeah, to, to Stephen's point, these models continually get better with more and more data, uh, but we don't have more and more data for, for most of the world's languages. So I think the, the way that OpenAI differed uh, from all the other language models that have been released recently uh, is that it really only looked at English. Um, it did some look at novel translation between English and, and, and French. Uh, but when you look at uh, BERT, um, you know, a, a month ago, or more before that, Facebook, just a few weeks ago, um, Burden and, and Laser from Facebook had a hundred different languages. Uh, so English, um, you know, it's only uh, constitutes 5% of the world's conversations daily. It's, it's the most privileged language in the world. Um, and it's the language for which it's most easy for us to fight fake news right now, uh, because we, we have AI that can identify fake versus real news. Uh, we have teams of, of people at the different social media companies doing this. Um, and so, uh, for me, rather than fake news or <laughs> killer robots or, or other things that your employer might be worried about, open AI, um, it's, uh, it's inclusion in, in AI, which I think is the biggest ethical problem uh, that we're facing right now. And if, if these models are only working at a scale that we have for English, um, then even the, the software component, the algorithms don't matter. Um, they're not going to be able to be used for 99% you know, of, of the world's languages. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm really curious that, you know, if, uh, if this model kind of model won't even work for the majority of the world's languages, where fighting fake news is the hardest right now, because uh, that data simply doesn't exist. Why, why, why are we particularly concerned then about the, the open AI English only model compared to others? Miles, you, uh, have a thought on that? Yeah. Please. I mean, yeah, so in, in terms of the sort of bias question and representativeness around the language, I think that it's definitely something we've considered in addition to other uh, sort of more subtle or non-obvious risks. And, you know, certainly we foregrounded the malicious use risks of sort of people deliberately using this, but that's also something we need to consider in terms of, you know, what, what is the consequence of releasing these models and, uh, you know, sort of bias around sex and gen, uh, sex and race is another thing that we've considered as a reason for caution. So, um, you know, that's not to say that we wouldn't, if we had, if we were, if we had no other concerns besides, you know, the English, uh, you know, bias, would we still release it? I don't know. That, that's an interesting question. But at the moment, well, I, 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 think, I, think a lot of these, I think a lot of these correlate too. Um, so obviously like language and race correlate strongly. Uh, but, but in some cases, the, the more closely intertwined. So um, your, uh, your race uh, through a lot of um, Latin America is determined more by the language you speak um, than your, your actual biological uh, ethnicity. Um, and uh, there is a huge gender bias there too. Uh, so in, in a lot of the world, you're more likely to have more education and be taught a privileged language if, uh, if you're uh, uh, raised male uh, than you are female. Um, uh, so these uh, really do correlate strongly with each other. Um, and also not to single you out, uh, uh, even though these other models have been released in, in more languages, that's missing from their evaluations as well. Uh, so I think they're, the first model to really get a lot of publicity in the machine learning community was the ELMO model out of um, uh, the Allen Institute. Uh, so they, they won a best paper award, I think two years ago, maybe last year um, at one of the big computational linguistics conferences. 
they evaluated uh, entity recognition, so identifying the names of like people, places, and, and locations. They evaluated a multilingual data set, which was both English and German, but if you look at their paper, they only have one set of results. Um, and then you say this, you just have to infer that they ignored all the German data and only evaluated on English. Um, and then the BERT paper out of Google did exactly the same. It reported a new state of the art on this data set, which is called a multilingual data set, um, but reported uh, only the English results. And, and English and German are basically as closely related as any two languages can be. Um, they're, they're like from the same language family. They're um, a lot of cognates. Uh, and I've played around with the ELMO model, and it doesn't get anywhere near state of the art um, uh, for this uh, German data set. Uh, BERT gets a little bit better, but again, um, not state of the art. And so I worry a little bit then, um, you know, to what extent have those researchers or, or ones at OpenAI, um, given the, the imperative of always having state of the art, have they tried this in, in other languages? Maybe something as closely related to English as German, they didn't get state of the art results. And, and as a result, they, they brushed it under the carpet rather than, uh, rather than sharing a, a really important negative result. Uh, Stephen, what, you have some thoughts on the language issue. Yeah, so one of the kind of, uh, kind of proof of concepts that's in the OpenAI paper, but we've also seen similar strands of research across the community um, is kind of twofold. One is that unsupervised language models, um, you know, substantially help translation. That's kind of an obvious. But in this situation, um, the OpenAI team were actually purposely stripping out and just retaining just English. Um, and for one of those reasons is that the data sets they were comparing against are primarily English. Um, but they ended up kind of accidentally leaving, I think it was 10 megabytes or so of French in there. Um, and these were kind of like, um, oh, I wish I knew more French, but like bonjour means hello in English, like as a sentence. <laughs> um, and the language model, it does, a, a reason I mentioned this as a proof of concept, they obviously tried to strip out as much of the language as they could, but ended up with some remaining in there. But even from that small amount, translating from French to English did reasonably well. And there's reasons for that, you know, the language model itself has just been learning what English looks like. And so from even a few examples of French, it can say, well, frequently these go across. Um, but the next stage up, which uh, is kind of the broader community, um, there are many uh, efforts to have, you know, unsupervised translation between languages. Um, and I think you made reference, Rob, to laser um, beforehand. Um, and the beautiful thing about this is that by helping, say, translate from English to German, which are very similar, but have, you know, at least a few, I guess, rules in terms of changing around the orders of things or, you know, different ways in which words combine, um, you can take those same kind of learnings for this model and transfer it to um, a very resource uh, low language and still have that um, transition across. Now, it is a completely fair point that um, it hasn't worked uh, the, the OpenAI team for their language model here hasn't um, applied it to, you know, further languages. Um, but one thing which I, I kind of personally have some, this is almost uh, unrelated experience for me. Uh, I released a language model sometime back called the AWD LSTM. Um, the fast.ai team took it and then have it as a kind of underlying basis. Now it's been immensely modified, but underlying basis originally for the um, language model ULM fit. And the fast AI community have then ported this to dozens of different languages. Um, and kind of the really fun thing for me is I was mainly focused on English. Um, I should probably expand my language modeling vocabulary, even if I don't know the languages myself. Um, but the code that I wrote, because it was general and you know, machine learning does this, transferred very well across these other languages. Um, and I'm, we have at least seen that the transformer model has been able to do this quite successfully in the past. Um, so I'd expect uh, naively, um, the OpenAI's model to, to have the same sorts of advantages. That, that part's definitely true. Uh, so the transformer models have been uh, a lot more successful um, across languages than, than the RNN LSTM based um, uh, based methods. Um, and that actually yeah, it comes down to um, uh, the reason that Stephen introduced uh, initially. Um, and that RNN LSTM based models are really only looking at uh, one word at a time and have to pass that memory all the way through rather than being smarter about finding long distance relationships. Uh, and so English is, is a complete outlier in, in terms of how important word order is. Um, it's more common in most languages that the subject, the verb, and the object are determined by the suffixes or the prefixes. Uh, they go in those words and the words can be in any order. Um, and so this is one of the things that is a little bit problematic about a lot of these results is that um, testing only on English, uh, which is it's not in the middle, it's just an outlier. 
for how important word order is and, and standardized spellings are and, and lack of suffixes, um, it doesn't really tell you about um, how well it's going to do more broadly. Uh, it's certainly the machine translation community, and that's what uh, we're seeing my company right now, the, the transformer-based methods are really blowing the, the RNN-based methods out of the water. Um, but that's not so clear in, in a lot of the language models recently, uh, even if they've been released in multiple languages, only been evaluated in English. Um, and so I, I think it, it's representing a, a, a real gap in, um, in the knowledge that people like me in industry can take from the research community. So a question I've got for Anima is really about kind of the, the true capabilities of these types of models. I think, you know, looking at the, uh, the sample that was released in the blog post, um, the, the, this, with this model, you can provide a prompt and the output is conditioned on this prompt. And so the prompt was something about scientists discover unicorns and there's, you know, a rather long and rather coherent text about uh, the backstory of this scientific discovery. It was, it was rather impressive to me. Um, you know, are you equally impressed? Uh, do you, you know, where do you think this fits in the kind of broad scheme of capability of these types of models? I think the, you know, that particular example, um, it, you know, I think you could argue that it kind of furthers the whole AI boogeyman terminator thing. It's particularly, um, unexpected, or at least I found it particularly unexpected. Um, you know, do you think, and we can, we'll ask OpenAI as well, like, and I think actually to, to be fair in the blog post, I said this was, I think they said uh, this was uh, an example that was selected out of 10 or something with that prompt. Um, but to what, to what extent are these um, types of examples cherry picked? Um, you know, what does it say about kind of where we are in this, you know, the, the path towards, uh, you know, some AI outcome that we don't fear. The thing that we're talking about here that we fear and that we're kind of not disclosing because we fear, you know, how close are we? And, you know, and, and a short answer is, right, I can't really tell without knowing all the details about the model, right, and having <laughs> access to the model. I mean, any researcher would, I think, uh, comment uh, I, that as like a one-line answer, right? But more... I guess, importantly, the issue is like, as you said, not one example, like, you know, the question of like, not just like how well it's doing on some cherry pick examples, but also what the failure modes were, like, what did the others look like? Was it completely incoherent or was it like diverse enough? Was it doing the same thing over and over again? I mean, these are all questions we ask for when we try to evaluate the models. Right. I mean, we can look at quantitative measures like perplexity, but that's, you know, like not enough by itself. Right. Like, you know, so that's I mean, there is no easy way to evaluate unsupervised learning. Right. That's uh, a general philosophical question. Like, what does it mean uh, to have done unsupervised learning well? Uh, because with supervised learning, we have a notion of accuracy. OK, you get 100 percent accuracy on your unseen test data set, then you're you know, really amazing, right? Uh, but even there, there are limitations because you may want to go beyond the test data set and there are further issues. And whereas with unsupervised learning, the question is, uh, what is a good model? Like, you know, when, when do we say that this, you know, the uh, answer that you obtained that you're happy with, was it because that it was coherent enough or did you want it to have certain factual reasoning? Did you want it to go through a certain logical set of steps, right? What would mean it to be impressive, right? One from a human evaluation perspective, that other from a more quantitative perspective, it is hard to tell. And that's why this is an open research topic that uh, the community thinks a lot about on how to evaluate language models. And, uh, and that's the reason we need the research community to be very much embedded in discussing this model and getting access to it. Miles, a reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree that it's much easier to evaluate the capabilities with more access and it's a very acute trade-off that we're trying to navigate. Um, I mean, one one point that Anima raised was that, uh, and you know, it's very much on point is that it was not obvious what the specific sort of threats we were concerned about were and you know, and more generally where to draw those lines. So 
Um, and, you know, this is still something we're thinking through and planning to share more about our process around sort of threat modeling and, and evaluating these capabilities. But just to give some intuition, um, you know, first of all, you know, this is not just about GPT-2, but also language models in general. So all of this should be sort of taken with a grain of salt that we don't know exactly where the biggest threats are and how quickly things will develop from here. But roughly we have, you know, a few sort of tiers of uh, or, you know, sources of information that we draw on. We look at how things are being used in the wild, like what what is actually the situation with fake news and, you know, where are the bottlenecks in terms of text production and so forth. So that's one set of perspectives is like, what is the role of, you know, text in society and what are the defenses against mass produced or uh, misleading text? And then there's sort of in-house analysis, uh, you know, through, you know, both sort of formally doing science as well as informally, you know, allowing uh, people access to the model, including non-experts within uh, the OpenAI organization. So that's where some of the samples came from for the blog post where sort of non-expert users playing out with an interactive version of the system as opposed to, you know, like Alec Radford and Jeff Wu trying to come up with the most impressive possible example. So, um, but it's, I, we agree that, you know, from the text, it's not obvious that that's the case. Um, yeah, so in, in terms of threat modeling, you know, it's important to think about you know, what can we do in house? What can we do with a given level of skill as well as, you know, what would fine tune variations of the system? Uh, you know, we gave the example of Amazon reviews as one example where we've looked at fine tuning and, and we're able to realize that it was quite tractable, um, but we're still thinking through, you know, what is the sort of suite of, uh, you know, questions you should ask about uh, powerful language models. Awesome. Uh, so Anima, a question for you from Connor on YouTube, uh, maybe pushing back a little bit. Do you see any limits with respect to the types of models or with respect to releasing models? Are there any societal considerations that an AI scientist should make in creating uh, or responsibilities that they bear in releasing their models? Where, where would you draw the line? I mean, certainly I think every scientist should think about societal Facts, right? Uh, in you know, in any discipline, I think we should all be uh, mindful of the impact we have through the deployment of technologies we release. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we need to ask ourselves: if I'm limiting a certain technology, uh, what are the trade-offs? Like, you know, there's both the benefits and the risks uh, uh, in releasing a technology, and we need to do that trade-off. And in the machine learning field, which has been very open until now, uh, most of it is in the open, right? And even if it's not, it doesn't take a whole lot of resources to get to those capabilities. And so locking it up seems counterproductive to me at this stage, especially in the context of language models and similar research where so much of it, very similar frameworks, you know, the open source code, they're all available. It doesn't take a lot to reproduce that by bad actors. On the other hand, it can limit access to uh, people in the marginalized communities, people with low, uh, you know, with limited access to resources. So that's why I see in this uh, setting the equation to be more tilted uh, towards release. Okay. Um... I saw a question or response from uh, from Miles or Amanda. Which of you is that? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's me in this case. Uh, I think one thing that's just worth noting is like we are like very sensitive to these issues. Like I agree that it's important that there's like equity among researchers and that one of the downsides of like not releasing anything, even just doing a partial release, is that um, you know researchers don't have access to it. Um, you have issues like you know, it makes it harder to replicate, or at least there's a delay in replication. Um, I think it's, it would be interesting to me, I guess I have two thoughts. One is that we might not even disagree about roughly the weight of all of the considerations here, because I think our position was one of kind of caution, where it's just like, the question isn't something like, do you think this is the exact right moment to do a partial release? Um, but rather something like, are you like, basically how certain are you that it isn't or how certain are you or how confident are you um, that you're actually on the right side of this scale um, and I think that's like the kind of questions that we're asking um, and in part also I think the, th the thing that this really highlights you know when we start bringing up these pros and cons 
is the need for like greater discussion of this in the ML community. So in some ways, when there isn't a kind of framework or there isn't a kind of agreed upon set of norms or there isn't a partnership on this, each actor is having to kind of think about these issues themselves. And for our part, we were like, well, that means that you have to like take on a lot of caution. Um, and it is important to be cautious, even if you're considering all of the um, negative consequences of that. Um, so I think it's great that this discussion is happening, but it is also worth noting that this could be made easier uh, if we did potentially have some of these mechanisms to like really help people think through um, when to release, what to release and the pros and cons. Yeah, and how to raise risks in a way that isn't seen or isn't actually, you know, alarmist. Uh, I mean, you know, so I think one perspective that I think, um, you know, is worth considering is that the AI community does not have all the answers and it's not the only one that needs to know what the tech technologies coming down the pipeline are. Um, and, you know, that was sort of where we were coming from with the outreach to journalists prior to the launch. And it's possible uh, that, you know, we could have done more, you know, increase the ratio of researcher, you know, outreach to, um, you know, non-researcher outreach. But, you know, the basic idea is that this is not, you know, just an open AI thing or not an AI community thing, but, you know, a more general question of sort of how do we handle these powerful technologies that seem to be coming, if, even if they're not, you know, totally there yet. Can you, can you comment uh, on the, the approach you took to evaluating the kind of the ethical field in the release, the level of kind of rigor or detail did you identify, you know, did you have a specific, you know, kind of persona or threat that you were most uh, concerned about, whether it's one that's been stated or, or unstated, or were you kind of reacting, responding, or anticipating just the broad uh, threat. How, you know, how did you kind of pursue this? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, there are a couple different lenses and we're still not sure what the right lens is. There's sort of, you know, GPT-2 itself and, you know, there's a fine-tuned version. We, you know, part of where we were coming from was seeing what the, the zero-shot version of GPT-2 was and that sort of gave us some heuristic evidence that even, even more powerful capabilities would be possible with fine-tuning or larger models. Um, so, you know, some of it was sort of, you know, anecdotal experiences of people interacting with the model, like Alec and Jeff just sort of seeing impressive things and uh, sort of, you know, a growing number of people interacting with the model, seeing how easy it was to get, uh, you know, human-ish looking outputs, not necessarily, you know, semantically accurate or, or factually correct to, you know, one of the points that Anima raised earlier, um, you know, what is the relevant threshold? We thought that it was you know, we still don't know exactly what the right threshold is, but something about sort of human passable, human-ish text uh, across a very wide range of domains for very little human input. So this is this is testable. Um, you know, there is obviously a lot of fake news out there right now, and and typical bad actor does this in a really simple way. It's you know like templates where you get to drop in certain words and it generates variations of those sentences. Um, so you know like hundred lines of code, but it's powerful. You have like ten sentence variants and ten sentences. You can create billions of different unique paragraphs. Uh, and so, you know, it's testable to, to create a system like that today um, and then have humans say, you know, which is, you know, which is the, um, uh, the more likely to be real. Um, and so that's, um, and, and that's standard, right? Like, how am I compared to the state of the art? And, and the paper had this. So the paper had a bunch of benchmarks against existing technologies to show that they're better than researchers. Um, but the ethical component, or at least everything I've seen so far, had, has been purely qualitative. Uh, and so as the, the ethics people in OpenAI, um, do you think you could convince the, the scientists to, to drop one academic benchmark and, and run some new studies which would uh, you know, really demonstrate what the, the negative impact might be compared to what's already out there? I mean, I think we're kind of heading in that direction in terms of quantifying the risks of models and things like bias. Uh, um, you know, in the context of language is something that we're starting to be more aware of. And I could, you know, I could imagine, you know, sort of like misuse potential, you know, label for, you know, different sizes of models or something. But I think we're still in the more sort of pre-conceptual framework phase in the sense that like we, we know a few considerations, we know a few sort of specific threats, we have some ideas for how to evaluate them. But ultimately, you know, we don't, we, we don't have in-house experts on, you know, everything related to fake news, everything related to cybersecurity, et cetera. So this is very much, you know, a conversation that we welcome input on. So specific ideas for testing the model, specific ideas for sort of threat modeling are super welcome. I think it's a little interesting that um, we're starting to have this discussion about text, which um, 
at least I might have an optimistic view, but I feel like the technology is still getting there in terms of the potential, you know, strongest misuse possibilities. Um, and that, you know, a lot of the time misinformation online isn't going to be about writing a long form article that seems reasonable. It's about writing a very short snippet that <coughs> is terrible in a bunch of ways and then spreading it everywhere. Um, but uh, this type of discussion, you know, we as a community should have really started properly having like, we shouldn't be caught in the dark by this as even a question because, you know, deep fakes has been substantially, um, you know, to many people quite destructive to their lives. Um, and for the same sorts of things that powered that, the, the code that we released, the pre-trained models which have been released, which were then built upon. Um, like, I, I feel like we as a community should have had a, a better response to that. Like, that should have been our awakening moment. Um, and this should be a potential, like, later, okay, you know, now we can start considering text modeling through this lens before it's time. Um, I don't know if anyone else has strong thoughts on that. Do we know where the right uh, forum is for that conversation? I, I'm not sure that it's Twitter. <laughs> I mean, Twitter is a part of it, but, um, you know, is it is it standards bodies? Is it kind of for, uh, fora at the conferences like NeurIPS and others? Or is it some, you know, structure that, uh, is it, you know, regulatory? Is it some structure that hasn't been created? Are there things that we can learn from uh, other, you know, technologies that have both beneficial uses and potential for weaponization that, you know, what have they done? I mean, I think I would be careful in using terms like weaponization, right? Because a lot of, you know, like discussions on, especially on Twitter, as you said, it's not the best medium, like tends to like devolve all the way into nuclear weapons and, you know, those, uh, you know, it's uh, cases of malicious use, right? And uh, uh, this is where there is a lot of, you know, what we saw that I was most disappointed about the whole episode was the media distortion in, uh, you know, wide reaching to the public in so many different countries. Uh, the message was, this is so dangerous that this is now locked up, right? That's what the public took away. And that's disappointing because I think that's a severe distortion from these much more nuanced conversation we are having today, right? This is what we need to be doing. We need to have the dialogue within the community and also with the public. Uh, I think there is still a big gap of what they think of as AI or even intelligence. You know, they are not able to truly evaluate how intelligent or how capable the current AI systems are. And I think that's um, a severe deficiency if we cannot close that gap between the research community and the general public. And that's what worries me the most that this conversation you know, we need to present it in a much more balanced form uh, to the public and to the media. Yeah, I, I also want to mention like one thing that I always think in my mind, if we think way back when um, Facebook released a paper that was essentially about two robots bartering um, and somehow like I was in Australia and I heard on like the nightly news, Facebook AI has like, you know, taken over something. They had to shut down the experiment. An experiment like, so dangerous, they had to shut it down. Exactly. But that's the thing, right? Like we have very few chances of reaching this global audience and we need to be very careful about what ends up stuck in their heads because um, we have the potential to put the right piece of information in someone's head so they know, you know, maybe to be wary about receiving in the future, receiving that email from grandma, which seems entirely syntactically correct, but she's asking about Bitcoin and has a, an account already to, for you to put money into, right? Like maybe that's the one piece of information we can somehow impart so worry about in the future. Um, but, you know, in, in the case of the Facebook AI story, you know, I feel like the information that has been locked in people's head is really quite wrong. And, um, you know, Facebook's, they took the, you know, they took it on themselves. They wrote a new blog post that explained just how it got distorted within the media. But I can, you know, imagine very strongly that people who saw that television station um, news segment um, in Australia are almost never going to read that blog post. And that's, I think, what I'm more worried about fake news about AI than AI generating the fake news. Uh, so maybe to, to start to wrap things up, uh, Miles and Amanda, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, how might you approach this differently? 
Uh, well, yeah, I'll give Amanda a sec to think about that and <laughs> while I get an easier <laughs> comment, which is that uh, in terms of venues for keeping the conversation going, uh, we'll be hosting a dinner at iClear for uh, where both policy people and technical people from OpenAI will be happy to discuss and uh, talk about the future of language models generally, not just GPT-2. Yeah, so I think that like um, ideally being able to have a kind of wide, wide range of inputs from uh, the ML community um, prior to like making a decision like this is going to be very helpful. Um, in the case of like uh, media attention, there's a sense in which it's like a little bit harder to uh, kind of navigate or control because like the way that something is going to be told, like as we've kind of heard is like, uh, like a little bit more delicate, although I really sympathize with this, um, you know, like if, if we could do the, not necessarily just how you do things differently, but like uh, like how you wish things would go. Um, you know, we were quite positive in the blog post as well. Like we talked about all of the positive um, ways that this uh, could be used. Um, and obviously like in general, like the thing that gets reported is quite negative. And I think that's like really unfortunate because like, you know, people who are doing ML research are doing it because they want to see, uh, you know, uh, excellent uses of it in the world and you know I think that uh, it wasn't our intention to say something like this research is all bad um, and you should be afraid of it um, rather just like hey we need to start having a conversation about this uh, so I think yeah I, I would like to see more of that and I think that it's correct that essentially what I would like to see more of is the kind of nuanced discussion that we're having here where we're sensitive to all of the pros and cons both of like doing open research um, and like the potential misuse of that research um, so yeah, I think like creating forums where people can do that um, is like the thing that I would really like to see going forward. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with all that. And just in general, uh, both OpenAI and, and the rest of the AI community need to find ways to smooth this conversation out over time so it doesn't happen all in, you know, in one you know, Twitter storm and sort of you know, find whether it's sort of you know, recurring workshops at conferences or whatever to sort of institutionalize this. Uh, how about the rest of you, uh, Stephen? What what would you like to see done differently, uh, and and what do you hope to see grow out of this uh, this scenario? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, I, I love language modeling. It's always exciting for me when something <laughs> comes out. So it's it's a good thing for me. Um, what I'm going to be interested in is, you know, at some point when I can play with this model, play with other models. Um, you almost always like one of the the biggest issues we have in the field is you know, overfitting. You find ways that these machine learning models learn to cheat in subtle and strange ways. Um, and one of the, you know, craziest examples of that is in visual question answering. So you give the machine learning model a, an image and then you ask it a question to answer. Um, for some time, these visual question answering systems did worse than just looking at the question without ever looking at the image. Um, and the field didn't quite realize it just because they didn't run the right experiments. Um, so that's the thing that I, I think I'd enjoy playing with. There's the modern version of that for text, which is for a question answering data set called Squad. Um, you know, many people were really excited about how intelligent it was, how many of the questions it got correct. But then a group went through and kind of methodically looked at each instance and was like, oh, with a, you know, a few dozen lines of code and regexes, uh, regular expressions, basically ways to capture certain patterns, you can answer all of these. So it's, it's a question of, okay, this language model is obviously quite good, but exactly how good is it? And you know, what interesting, strange methods of cheating might it be using that's able to trick all of us at a glance? Uh, Rob? Yeah, so I, 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 what I said earlier, and, and to speak to Anima's point about making sure the right message gets out there, um, I, I felt like for me, uh, the release wasn't most offensive in terms of what wasn't and what wasn't public. Um, I think the biggest shortcoming was that it was only in English, um, that it was uh, not diverse, that it was the most privileged language, uh, which correlates with almost every other privileged demographic. Um, and uh, that to me was the, the bigger ethical concern than anything to do with um, what actually got released in terms of the language model. Anima? Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, putting more thought process into uh, you know, collaborating with academia and research community in general, right? And making sure that especially uh, the, you know, researchers with less compute resources are not at a disadvantage. 
that's something uh, you know nonprofit like OpenAI would have a very big role to play, right? To uh, remove the barriers and to truly democratize AI. Uh, I think thinking also on that angle while quantifying the risks and coming up with a more quantitative analysis of risks and also maybe incentive mechanisms like how to better deploy AI and better release it to the community. These are all things we can you know, do further research and come up with some best practices for the community and also best practices in terms of how we talk about this to the general media and how this gets reported. Um, that's something we as a community need to work more about. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I love the, uh, that you're hosting the dinner at uh, iClear, but I'd also love to see, um, you know, OpenAI kind of roll up its sleeves and help figure out where are the right places to have this conversation more formally and, you know, who the right people are to bring to the table. A number of the folks that I've commented on YouTube and Twitter about, you know, security researchers have deal, dealt with this kind of issue for a long time. How do we get them into the fold? You know, folks have been doing threat modeling. How do we get them into the fold? Um, there's a lot of work that has to happen to, um, you know, create, you know, that space and uh, and use it to further the conversation. And, you know, I'd love to see more uh, happening there. But for tonight, I'm glad to be part of the, you know, getting this beyond 280 characters a pop. Mm -hmm. um, and thank all of you for taking the time to, uh, to jump on and, and talk about this really important issue. Thanks, thank you. Thanks yeah. a lot for doing this. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Thanks, everyone, for joining via YouTube Live. Yeah. And uh, before we go, actually, why not, um, we'll put it in the, the description when we post the video. But uh, for folks who aren't following all of you on Twitter, why don't we do a, a quick uh, Twitter handle uh, roll call. Um, Animan and Kumar. I'm sorry. Rob? Uh, WW Rob, Worldwide Rob. Smerity? His Smerity. Smerity. <laughs> <laughs> Miles underscore Brundage? Yeah, Miles underscore Brundage. I had to check if there's a space or. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just Amanda Askel, all one word. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks. Thanks again, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thanks.